I love, again, having keynotes who have been involved in the industry but are also driving the industry in new, fascinating ways and are really taking us uh, to the next level of what we're doing. And with that, I'm going to get off stage, turn it over to Gersh to make this all happen. Cool. Thank you so much. So this is my, in the back, well, I can tell my mic's working all right, I think. Okay, good. Um, so before I get started, um, I come from Seattle, Washington, um, and there's a big games community over there. Before that, I was in California. There's a big games community over there, and it's been fantastic as I've mostly spent time actually kind of observing, listening, watching the interaction, going to a few different talks, spending a bunch of time over here um, in the booth and seeing the energy and seeing the passion and the creativity that's in Georgia. And that's really, really cool to see the center of excellence in game development right here. So it's great to be a part of that. Now, I made a mistake yesterday of uh, watching the keynote uh, because my keynote is not as good. I'm, <laughs> I'm not as good. That guy, Jesse, man, I'll tell you, like his PowerPoint skills, you know, I don't do PowerPoint, I do note cards. I used to do PowerPoint. And then, uh, and then you see too many PowerPoints, so you end up just not doing PowerPoint anymore. Um, so I'm gonna get started with a, with a little bit of, of a quiz, okay? And we'll see if anyone can get this. Around 2003, 2004, um, there, was a, there was a game, a particular game that I'm thinking about that changed our industry forever, okay? And this was the biggest game Okay, in terms of almost every single metric, but let's say players, by I think two orders of magnitude, then the next highest game. And now what was that game? This is 2003, 2004. Raise your hand. All right, I'll repeat for the, for the, uh, the viewing audience, Halo 2. Halo 2 is huge and I love that game. Big Halo fan, but it wasn't Halo 2 in the back. Oh, very, very good guess. So The Sims was a huge game, absolutely huge. Uh, I think kind of the first of its kind, but uh, this game was actually bigger than The Sims. Ooh, very, very good guess. So World of Warcraft was the guess. Uh, World of Warcraft uh, reached at its peak, I think around 10 million. Um, fantastic game, but this game was actually bigger than that. Anyone else? Uh, well, we'll do right here. Ooh, Half-Life, oh man, and, I, and I, I, I wish it was a Half-Life 3 sometime, but no, it wasn't Half-Life 2. It was not Half-Life 2, nothing to announce today. All right, we'll do, we'll do one more guess, so let's make it count in the back. Of Ooh, Farmville. Uh, the year's off, but, um, uh, uh, but, that, but that's, a, that's, a, that's a good guess. Uh, but it would actually, it was not Farmville. Um, so the, I'll give you, actually, we'll do one more guess, but I'll give you, I'll, but I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a hint first. Um, so the format of this game was this game was a, uh, a multiplayer game, so um, multiple players, um, and it was very innovative in terms of uh, the input mechanic. It was super innovative. So in the back. All right, so he said EVE Online, and it is, unfortunately not EVE Online. <laughs> I'll leave EVE Online with the Okay, all right, we'll do one more, one more in the back. Ooh, I love Magic the Gathering, but it was not Magic the Gathering. Um, okay, so uh, so when you so when you think about games, uh, if you break if you break a game down to, to its core, um, a game is uh, an experience, and it's it's different than linear media in that uh, with linear media, whether we're talking about Netflix, we're talking about a movie, we're talking about traditional television, it's a one way thing. I watch, plot happens, and then that's it. But games, with games. You watch, and there's that output, but then there's an input, and then the game changes, okay? So based on input, game changes. And that's really kind of the core definition of what a game is. And so around, actually it was 2002 that this game really started to take off, but around 2003, 2004, uh, where it peaked at around uh, 40 million uh, active players. And uh, this game uh, was a game in which uh, several people started competing against each other, and then on a cadence, uh, using their phones, um, the players would, Im would do a single piece of input and affect the outcome of this game. And this game was American Idol, okay? Yeah, okay? 
Amer- Amer- American Idol, think about it, American Idol, and those will become more important later, but American Idol was the biggest game by far, by far, by far, by far, over any other game in terms of the female audience that it reached, the diverse audience that it reached, in terms of just number of viewers worldwide, et cetera. By every single metric, it was actually the biggest game in the early 2000s. Um, so now I, I want to get to know you guys a little bit. So can you raise your hand if you're a student? All right. Okay, in that case, uh, if you want a job at Microsoft, no, I'm just kidding. But, uh, but, uh, but I will say, um, uh, I will be around later. Um, so if you, know, if you do have a resume, a card, something like that, after we're kind of done with this, I'll be hanging out a little bit. And even though this talk's not about career advice, um, you know, we can, we can do kind of some of that one-on-one maybe or in the Q&A. Okay, now, um, uh, how many of you are currently working on a game? Okay, now I should ask how many of you are not working on a game? Okay, that's kind of interesting. Okay, uh, how many artists do we have? Okay, uh, how many programmers? Designers? Okay, I must have missed something. Some room. Audio, music, music or audio? There we go. Okay, okay, good. Um, so uh, I, I, wanna, I wanna turn back the clock a little bit. Uh, this is gonna go back uh, 10 years, maybe, maybe 15 years, uh, to when I was in the games industry. So I started in the games industry and I was an, ind- I was an independent developer. And I got my start in a similar to what way that maybe many of you will get your start. And so I was a student and I was taking a class at the University of Southern California. Uh, and the University of Southern California didn't have a games program at the time. They had like a, a minor you could take. And, uh, I, and I got my start there with a, with a, with a group of kids and we, uh, a group of students, and we, we got together and we built this game uh, that would uh, go on to later win the IGF, get us a three game publishing deal, um, and then form a company. And that company exists to this day. They're doing VR stuff like I'm sure every other company on the planet's doing. Uh, but, but, I, but, I, but I wanna tell you a couple stories. So the first story, is how we got that publishing deal. So I remember, and, and, and I did this at least 10 different times, but I, I, I remember sitting on the eighth floor of a building I can't remember, at a time I can't remember, and I was waiting, and I was looking at my clock. It had been an hour and 45 minutes, and I was sitting outside, and I was staring at this door. And I knew that at any moment, outside that door would walk the vice president of Konami, and he would walk from this door, to this door, and I had 30 seconds to go pitch in my game, okay? And that was how it worked. Because, because back then, you, you couldn't self-publish. Like, this is before app stores. The only way you could get a game was you had to get a publisher, because the publisher could go talk to the person who owned the console, and you could go get your game on the console. And so I waited, and I waited, and then the door opened. And now the vice presidents, these guys, they don't go by themselves, they have an entourage, at least they did back in the day. And so, He's, he's walking to his next and I say, hey, excuse me, um, by the way, big fan of yours. Uh, do, you have a, do you have a couple seconds? He's super busy. And he's like, oh, okay, sure. Yeah. And, I, and I give him my game. And then he, he, pick, he picks up the game and he kind of starts playing it. Uh-oh, we're halfway there. We're halfway to his meeting. What's going to happen? Um, and then he just starts smiling. And then, and then he says, and he, he motions his right, he says, huh, get over here. Check this game out. Check this game out. And now he's at his meeting and he stopped. And Hans is like, oh, this is cool. This is really cool. Um, and, uh, and, then he, and then he turns and he says, oh, I got to get going. But um, do you guys have time Friday to come up to the Konami office to go pitch this to our executive vice president? And of course, you say, yes. And then he's like, because Nintendo was pushing the mic at the time. They said, and then we should totally have the microphone and touch and all this. This is before touch the thing. And then but a, a vice president of the Konami is saying something to you. And then you just, you do this. You do, if you're ever in this position, you just do... Of course, yeah, totally. Uh, VR, a- quantum mechanic, yeah, everything. Build a rocket, yeah, yes, yes, we can. Yeah, uh, we can deliver that. Of course, we can. So, uh, and then the re- the rest, the rest is kind of history. But, but I want to tell that story because um, that gives you a sense for how things were, even I would say ten years ago. So, like ten years ago, that was the world we lived in. And ten years ago, you would spend ninety percent of your time because this was before engines, before like Unity wasn't a thing. So you spend uh, 90% of your time building memory managers and uh, texture systems and like the parallax backgrounds, that, 
that took forever, okay? Like, like just getting, I, I remember um, that uh, you couldn't have more than uh, 12 rotations on one of the Nintendo systems. So we wanted to have something else rotate. We had to cut a character. Like, that was how crazy it was. And, and but, but that was... That was that was the world. You spent you spent ninety percent of your time building these level editors, these tools, and then you got to spend ten percent of your time, if you're lucky, to go build your actual game. And so that so that was that was the world back then. And that's and I and I did that for a little bit. Like I did games like that for a little bit, but then I stopped and I thought that there would be more to this. There was just more. Like there it had to be better. And so I came to Microsoft to go change that because Microsoft was working on this product called X and A. And uh, actually, this is a good question. Has anybody heard of X and A? Raise your hand. Wow. Okay. Good. Good. So, so I so I, w I went to go join this small team at the time that was working on this product called X and A. Does anyone know what X and A stands for? That's. It doesn't stand for anything. He's actually correct. It stands for absolutely nothing. Um, so, so anyway, that's a piece of trivia. But um, but but X and A was special because you have to imagine that uh, at the time, the idea people people were so afraid. Okay, the the games industry was this walled garden that if you weren't in this special little group and you didn't know somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody, you had to be out here. You didn't get to come in. Like it was this it was this little community, and the people in here they didn't want the people out there coming in. Nobody wanted that. Because they were scared. Because it turns out, like back then, when you didn't have to worry about competition because there weren't many people who could make games, the games, you were kind of guaranteed a certain level of success. So no, they didn't want to open gaming up to everybody. That was scary. Like, that was incredibly scary. And consoles, by the way, or any kind of hardware, they weren't built with security in mind. They were built with, uh, well, I know you, and I trust you, and so don't hack my console. Now, you open it up, and then suddenly... Uh, I mean, these consoles have low-level access to drivers, all kinds of exploits. You can do all kinds of exploits. So that was very, very scary. And so, um, and this will be a theme in my career is I become, you, you always go in working on one thing and then you become an expert at another thing. And so throughout my career, I've tried to be a champion for independent developers. And in doing so, I become an expert at security, which is really weird. But, but that's kind of what happens. And so we built this sandbox that housed uh, C Sharp was our language that we did. And that allowed us to, at least, at least the people who were complaining about security, it was like, well, we'll be at this notion of a sandbox. So the games ran in the sandbox. And then that system was over here. And then so we could say, well, don't, wor don't worry about security. They can't get to some of this other stuff. We kind of, and we, but that caused us to restrict access to some things. So, but we, but we solved that problem. And then whew, that was a lot of work. Like, you don't understand, that was a lot of work to go do that. There was some real rocket science that happened to go create this insecure thing, make it secure. Uh, and then we thought we were done. But then people wanted more. They actually wanted to sell their, their games. Is that crazy? They didn't just want to like hand them in zip files to each other. So, so, they, so they wanted to go sell their games. And then, so we said, okay. But then everybody else who was freaking out before about security, man, that now the business people started going in and they were starting to freak out about like, well, but can we have Regular, like, what if you make what if you make a game that's a Unity tutorial? Does that show up next to like Halo Five? Is that the way it works? And then what what does Halo Five think about that? That your game show? Up? So there's a lot of like those concerns. Um, and then they say, well, what if you have a thousand people submit a game? Uh, how are you how are you going to uh, certify those games? By the way, for those of you who don't know, uh, Nintendo saved the video game industry in the 80s, okay, by doing this thing called certification. And certification was this giant 200-page document that said, thou shall not have a pause screen without an animation. Thou shall not have a controller disconnect and not be able to reconnect without a thing that says, do you want to reconnect and press the A button and then parry? Like, it was just pages and pages and pages of, of, of things. In fact, it was so many pages that actually, there are still to this day people whose job it is, they're almost like lawyers. They understand these documents, and they can interpret them for you and apply them to your game. And so there was that whole business, and people said, "Well, you can't, you can't automate that because that's a human being goes in, they check the policy, they play your, they would actually play through the whole entire game, every single part of the whole game." Uh, China still does this uh, for different reasons, and so, 
So, but there was this guy, Doug Lewis, who I worked with, who said, no, I think, I, I think I've got a shot at automating it. And, uh, and so I actually, I used to work on SharePoint, but uh, for a brief period of time. Uh, but a lot of people don't know that SharePoint gave way to the first uh, games marketplace. Because SharePoint was really good at, at, it was good at a few things, but it was really good at permissions. And so it was like, because that was one of the big things, is, is you're working on a game, you're working on a game, you're working on a game. We can only see our games. We can't see other people's games. And then Microsoft has to come in, certify your game, check your game, and does it. So, so there's a whole bunch of roles and permissions that SharePoint was actually really good at. And then so uh, built on top of SharePoint, um, and it became actually the biggest SharePoint application on the planet. Ran the 360 business for many, many years. And uh, I was born the first game store. Okay, And that was, we called it the um, uh, Xbox. It wasn't Xbox Live. It was Xbox Live Community Games and it changes its name later. And it was based on the idea that um, it was using this innovative system called reviews, uh, the market would be regulated. And then we wouldn't have to certify every single game. And then soon later came uh, Apple with the iOS App Store. But I promise you that if it hadn't been for XNA, if it hadn't been for um, uh, the XNA store, there would be no Apple Store. Okay, iOS wouldn't have opened it up. Um, and then, of course, there were lots and lots of other stores after that um, that kind of happened. But 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 there's always a first, okay? And then and then a bunch of other people who make it popular. Uh, but but we kind of weren't done because XNA enabled a whole generation of programmers to create games. But there were a lot of other roles like artists. And then so a company called Unity came along, Unity 3D. Now it's true that there was Game Maker. I was using Game Maker. Um, and, a, and a bunch of other engines that deserve credit as well. But I think Unity um, really, really made good on its mission statement. And its mission statement was to democratize game development. And that's like, and, and I'll tell you, like I have a lot of my very, very good friends I've been in the industry a long time um, are now long time people at Unity. And they believe in that. Like they believe in that to their core, um, as I do. Uh, you know, what we do, it's, it's not about getting the next billion dollars. Like that's, you know, that's not why we're doing what we're doing. It's really about democratizing game development because it's the right thing to do. It's because there's a lot of voices in games that um, need to be heard. And so we need to build a platform for you to go um, express your vision and connect with the people uh, who should receive your message. And so Unity comes along, and Unity comes along and takes a different point of view. Game development is not for the super hardcore assembly level rocket scientists. Game development should be for everybody. And so they have this innovative editor that resembles one of the Adobe products that are built for artists. And then they come along with the asset store. And the asset store allows you to quickly have a game. So a lot of you know what that is and kind of take it for granted. But at the time, that was, it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy to have something like that. And then they announced that they're giving it away for free. And that was, that was ridiculous. So. If you make under $100,000, um, if you're a student, you get Unity, you get it for free. And then, un and then Epic followed suit, okay? And then a bunch of other engines followed suit. So now you've democratized uh, game development. And then, and this is over the course, now we're, we're probably at seven years, eight years into uh, my career on Xbox, that this has happened. And then I look at all these things happening. And, and I made a promise to myself. I said that, when it was easy enough to go build games, then I would quit and I'd go back to building games. And so I thought about it, and I thought about leaving Microsoft, and I thought that maybe we were done here. And I talked to a bunch of my developer friends, and I, and, and I remember the advice that I used to give 10 years ago. And what I used to say was, just fo focus on making a great game. Like, just focus on making a great game. And what I mean by that is you've got story, you've got art, you've got gameplay. Do, do two of those three really well. Pick two, do two of those three really well, and then the rest is going to take care of itself. That's what I would tell people. Now, today, uh, we're tracking towards probably about 6,000 games that are going to come out on Steam this year. It's going to be more next year. And there's a lot of good games. There's a lot of good games that do three out of three things well. In fact, there's a lot of good games right here that do three out of three things well. But guess what? All those games, they're not sitting on their hands knowing that they're going to get 100,000 units in sales. No. No, I'll bet you guys are scared that you won't even break, will you break 1,000? Because that's even hard on Steam today, break 1,000. 
Breaking 10,000, that's really hard. Show of hands, does anyone have a game out right now that's over 20,000 on Steam? Okay, so we got to, nice, good job, that's awesome. Good for you, good for you. Yeah. So it's, you know, and, 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 I, and I, I go to a lot of these, I go to a lot of these conferences, and I, like, I don't want to say I get angry, but I do get a little bit angry when I see people who I know ship their game years and years ago on Steam, and then they give the advice, like, oh, just make a good game, and I'm like, well, look, you shipped on Steam 10 years ago, or however long it was ago, when there were, like, three games on Steam, and so that advice, like, that advice just doesn't hold. Look, I, I, I won an IGF award, but I've entered the IGF ever since. I haven't even got nominated, okay? If I entered with that game that I won today, I wouldn't, get nom I wouldn't be nominated. Like, it's gotten so competitive. It's gotten so competitive that every single day, there are 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 great games that no one will ever download, okay? It's gotten so competitive. So no, I don't think we're done. Like, I don't think we're done. I think there's one last problem to solve, and it's the most important problem of all. And that's the problem of discovery. And so that is what this talk is about. Now, before we go into that, there are some trends. I'm going to go on a tangent for a little bit, so bear with me. But there's a, there's a couple tr uh, trends that are interesting to think about. Okay, As somebody who has spent a long, long time on the other side of the games industry, on the publishing side, on the platform side, when I go and I see trends, even though it's not really this talk, I thought I'd share because I think they're interesting because I have a different perspective. So... Um, acquisition is very hard. And so when mobile came around, you had free-to-play. And so free-to-play was the idea that, well, somebody paying money, that's a big barrier to entry. So if the game is free, you can think of that as just advertising to get them into your funnel, and then you can sell them DLC, you can sell them something else afterwards. Uh, and then there's subscriptions, and subscriptions are super new. So these are things like EA Access. For $5 a month, you can get access to some amazing games. Uh, Xbox Game Pass, for $10 a month, you can get access to over 100 games with uh, many new games added every single month. You do the math as a consumer, and you're like, well, here's my money. Like, it just makes sense. And uh, subscriptions is going to save, I think, a lot of our industry, where if you think about, like, the typical purchasing pattern for, let's say, a holiday $60, a premium title, a premium price game in the holiday, it's one game, like, some consumers get to buy more, but a lot of consumers just get to buy one game. But then there's so many games that come out, so they just get to buy one game. And a lot of times those huge, huge games, I'm talking about the Halos, you know, et cetera, of the world, their biggest competition isn't the other first-person shooters in the genre. It's actually last year's game. Like, that's actually the biggest competition. And so this is kind of a problem. So you're seeing more and more games uh, doing a subscription style or some kind of a uh, base game with DLC, something like that, to sort of offset that. And uh, but you know th those are, those are all interesting things that can be applied, I think, for very very large games. Hard to do for small games. Uh, but but bigger than that, I think the thing that's going to foundationally change our industry is live streaming. Okay. And by the end of this, you'll understand what I mean by that. So when the CEO of Ubisoft was asked. What is the biggest trend, the biggest change, the biggest phenomenon in the game industry? He was asked this at E3, he did an AMA. Um, he started and he said, I think a lot of you expect me to say VR. They announced a bunch of VR stuff that they're doing, um, some pretty cool stuff. He said, but um, although VR is huge, and I don't want to you know, I don't want to say that it's not, because I think it is. I think it represents a, uh, a, a difference in terms of the stories that we can tell and the immersiveness that we can create. Um, but by far and away, uh, live streaming is going to fundamentally change the way that we think about game design. Like, absolutely at, at our core. It's going to change the way we think about game design. Because already, I mean, a long, long time, uh, it was actually many years ago, but uh, last year, uh, more people on a console spent time watching games and playing games. And so we're soon going to be in a world where when you create a game, and when I create a game, more people will experience that game through a website, watching someone else play it, than actually playing it themselves. And so, with, and that that was just actually the gap will continue to get bigger and bigger. And so, when you think about that, it becomes very hard for you to say, "I'm going to go build a game today 
and I'm going to design it without thinking about 60, 70, 80% of my audience. It seems kind of weird to think about that when you think about game design. And so that's what I mean. I mean it's going to be from the ground up. And the more I get to talk to probably eight or nine, maybe ten, uh, huge game developers every single week about live streaming. So I get to talk to the biggest names in the industry that you've heard of about live streaming. And we get to talk about what they think about it, how they think about it. And let me tell you that every single one of them is now thinking for their next set of games, how do I build it from the very, very beginning thinking about live streaming? Because there is a direct correlation between how well you're doing in terms of streamers and viewers to your sales. So you used to think about a lot of traditional advertising, but now you, but now you can just focus on live streaming as a funnel into your sales. So I want to tell a story. So uh, how, uh, how many people have played or heard of Halo, the Halo franchise? Oh, good. Okay, great. Um, so uh, my, my favorite one was, uh, uh, how, how many people have heard of the Ford Into Dawn series? Just a few. Okay, well, I'll explain it. So uh, Ford Into Dawn was a television series based on the Halo universe. And it's, it's, uh, I think it's on Netflix still, so you can still watch it there. And, and we had it on YouTube. And I remember that the head of marketing at the time, he said this thing to me that, that has just stuck with me uh, many, many years later, where he said, you know, the funny thing is all the people who enjoyed Ford Under Dawn didn't realize that it was an ad for Halo. They didn't realize that Ford Under Dawn was, was funded out of our marketing budget. It, it, was, it wasn't, you know, uh, part of our, ga our game franchise budget. It was actually not game dev, it was marketing marketing budget. And he said, and the genius thing about that, he said, I think there's a future where if you can find a way, and this is many, many years before live streaming, he said, if you can find a way to make advertising compelling content, compelling standalone content by itself, then that's gold. And you figured out something pretty special. And so when I, if I were to tell you that there is a place where millions and millions of people soon to be billions of people go and spend more hours than they spend on Netflix watching advertisements for games, for your games. And you don't have to pay anything for that advertisement. It'd be pretty cool. So that, 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 is, that is live streaming. Like live streaming is, is one of the most, well I shouldn't say it's one of the most, it's literally the most effective way that um, you can create awareness for your game and it actually doesn't cost a dime. So, now, whether that, you know, that stays, you know, we'll see, and there are top YouTubers and all exceptions like that. But, but for the most part, um, that's, that's why live streaming is so exciting. It's so exciting because it is the most cost-effective way that you can drive engagement into your games and drive discovery into your games. And so in terms of the size of the industry, it's people spend today, this is today, more hours watching games um, uh, than they spend watching Netflix. So that's like an order of magnitude type of thing. And for a, in, ter in terms of an evolution, we, we started, so live streaming goes back to YouTube Let's Plays. And uh, I have a, a bunch of big, huge YouTubers on the Mixer team, so I'm, I'm on the Mixer team. And we have a lot of top streamers there. And uh, one of the top streamers, whose name is Lucklin, uh, he tells me this story. He was a million plus sub. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you guys, did, you get, did any of you guys watch Minecraft at all? YouTube videos? Okay, so I don't know if you heard of Leckland, but, um, but he was a big, uh, he did Minecraft WD, and um, he was a big Minecraft streamer, and he, he tells me this story that I really like, which is, uh, he started out on YouTube making videos, and uh, he would produce these videos, and then the comments, YouTube comments, you get to comment on his video, he'd go read through the comments, and he'd make another video, uh, but the comments weren't synced to the video, um, so it was very, very hard for him to kind of like and you did only show you the page of them, so it was very hard for him to get a sense of like what his audience thought. And then came along this service called Twitch. And Twitch did something where they put the comments in the video side by side. And then that changed everything because suddenly the comments and the video were synchronized so you could see, and you could get this extra level of interaction. But at the time, and I, ironically enough, I was actually working on Twitch at that time, um, the latency was, uh, on a good day, we were at 90 seconds. Of latency. So if something would happen in the stream, about a minute and a half later, the audience would commentate. No, that wouldn't actually happen. So the audience ended up kind of chatting amongst themselves, and then the streamer would be doing their thing, the audience would be chatting amongst themselves. Now, latency went down over the years, um, and it's gone down and down and down. Um, but then comes along this company called Mixer, okay? And that's the folks watching actually online. Um, so Mixer was this company, it was called Beam actually, before, before we did the name change, that had 
this ultra low latency streaming technology, sub second near real time. So even today's services, um, you're talking two to five seconds of latency on the low end. A lot of times it's 10 plus seconds uh, on, on sort of an average. Uh, but Mixer does a sub second thing. And so the, 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 the power of live, like there's, a, there's this powerful thing about live, like all of you are here right now and not watching on the internet. Like if you, could, you can imagine like we could just have these conferences, you could watch them, or you could be here and experience them because there's this power to live events. And it's that in this moment, in this unique moment, you don't know what's gonna happen next. And your presence here could actually change what's gonna happen next. And that's what makes live super exciting. And so this future that's, that's enabled because of low latency is interactive live content. Something like American Idol, except the nth degree. And we'll talk about examples of what that could be. Where rather than just watching, you're actually playing with me, okay? So um, now I wanna talk about a game called uh, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. Has anyone uh, heard of that? Good, okay, I got an educated audience. Who has not heard of Player Unknown's Battlegrounds? Anybody? Okay, good. Oh, a couple of people, okay. So uh, please check it out. Um, so uh, so uh, pu uh, PUBG, as it's called in the office, um, really took everyone by surprise. Like it really took everyone by surprise. And uh, Fortnite has, a, has a, a battle royale mode. You'll see a lot more games have battle royale modes. I think a lot of people are gonna try to fast copy that game. Um, it's a game that came out of nowhere. It had, it, so on paper it should have failed. Uh, it's the first time that guy's ever made a game. Okay, he's not even a game developer. Uh, it had no traditional, zero traditional marketing. Okay, um, but it is, it is, it is so far broken just about every record, every world record that is ever in existence around like how good a game can possibly be. And it continues to break those records. Like it has no signs of slowing down. And that game, that game understood the importance of live streaming. And that's what, he, that's what he did. He got together with a few influencers and he used those influencers to grow and grow and grow and grow. And he had this game that's perfect for live streaming. You can be somebody who plays that game and you're super talented, you run in with a big gun, you shoot everybody, and then you can get down to the last 10 people and some guy who's been waiting the whole time under a tree snipes you and then wins the whole thing. And you, or you have a Jeep and you roll over and kill yourself at the last month. Like there's just, there's a, uh, yeah, some of you probably have done that, huh? So, so you, just, you just don't know what's gonna happen. It's super intense, you don't know what's gonna happen. Like that's what I mean in terms of a game that's great for live streaming. And so when you, when you think about how to make a game great for a live streamer, you gotta put yourself in the mindset of how they think. Now live streamers, and hope, I hate to break it to you, same thing with reality television, it, it's scripted and they're actors, okay? So you know, we'll get that out of the way. So, uh, so all the big, big streamers are actors. And so what I mean by that is they'll probably go through and play a game beforehand to familiarize themselves with possible plot points that they can create for their stream. And uh, they, because, because they need to make sure that um, it's engaging as it can be. So if they're playing a horror game and there's a scare, a scare moment, like rather than just going, like, they'll fall out of their chair. Like, look, fall out of their chair. Where'd they go? They fell out of their chair. They're so scared. So you just, you're trying to like just amplify everything that's going on uh, so that, because you're still real, you're still genuine, but you're just trying to amplify it like an actor would um, to make it entertaining. And now they have, a, they have some challenges though. They got some challenges in that one, they have a lot of dead time to fill, okay? So if you're streaming for three hours, that's on the short end, but you might be streaming 12 hours, you might be streaming 24, that is a long, 24 hours to stream. That is a long time. You gotta be entertaining for 24 hours. How many people think they could be entertaining for 24 hours? I'm gonna raise my hand because I, can, I can't be entertained for an hour. Apparently, but you know, like, so. Yeah, I mean it's hard. It's hard. So the, so these people, these people are struggling. But um, but li but live streaming helps them with that because when the audience can change the outcome, they create these organic moments where they don't have to act. They can just react naturally, and it's exciting. It's interesting. And I'll talk about an example of that. Second thing is the barrier to chat. So the goal is we want to get people chatting. We want to get people talking. But if if you're lurking, which most of us are in live streams, it's really hard. Like if I'm streaming, it's really hard to introduce yourself and say, hi, I want, you know, I want to talk. Like that's super intimidating. So Facebook, they sort of figured this thing out, which I call light interactions. 
And so because Facebook has the same problem, which was you post a, a picture or something, and then you want to get uh, the community kind of engaged. And so they create the like buttons. And so now everyone's got the ability to like something. Because a like is something where you don't have to think about it. You can just like, 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 like. And now you've interacted with this person you haven't talked to in years and years and years. And now they got some emojis and things like that. And so interaction does the same thing. Like if I can press a button on a stream and play a sound in your stream, or I can make you dance or do, do something like that, I, I don't have to think of something clever to say and clever and witty to say. I can just press a button and then we're interacting. So uh, to, to give you an example of this, um, how many people have played Killing Floor 2? All right. By the way, this is a Georgia game, and they're sponsoring this. So if you haven't, please go check it out. <laughs> okay. Like, especially if you want a job at Tripwire. I don't know if you're watching that presentation. But go, go, go check out Killing Floor 2. So I, I love Killing Floor 2. Okay. So Killing Floor 2, uh, and specifically, it's actually not my genre of game, but I love them because of what they did with Interactive. So Killing Floor 2, if you're watching a Killing Floor 2 stream, uh, as a viewer, you get the video, and then you've got these two buttons that show up at the bottom of your screen. One says help, the other one says hurt. And if you choose to help, you can give them grenades, you can give them health, you can give more ammo, um, uh, you can give them some in-game currency, you can trigger this bullet time effect, uh, you can do a couple other things. And then if you hurt, you can enrage the zombies, uh, you can spawn a giant zombie, uh, and uh, you can puke on the player. Where they like they just can't see. It's just all green. They can't. They don't know where they're. They're bumping into walls. They can't see. So, uh, what I what I loved about that was uh, when it first came on. And Wes is smiling because he knows because he 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 started from this. He was giving out keys, right? So, um, uh, when um, when Killing Floor Two with that interactivity hit Mixer, Mixer exploded like absolutely exploded. You had. A streamer. So this is a game where, where waves of zombies come and attack you and you try to defend yourself. And when the streamer was about to die and the zombie basically he killed them, suddenly it said, Gersh just gave you help. And they survived, they killed the zombie, they move on to the next level. And then they said, hey, thanks, Gersh. And then guess what happened the next time? They said, hey, has anyone got some ammo? Quick, give me ammo. And then suddenly there was this, oh, thanks for giving me ammo. And then there was this back and forth between the audience and the viewers, and they were talking and they were talking, and there wasn't this dead time, there wasn't like, you know, just this. No, it was talking. It was back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And then when somebody thought they were done with the wave, then suddenly they're like, oh, we're done. That was, that was close. And then, boom, a boss zombie shows up and then kills them. So, like, the hurt thing came in, too. And, uh, and they're like, no, so-and-so, stop it. And there was this yelling and back and forth, and it was like something that you just you had never seen before. Because I'm, I promise you that the first time you do it, there's something absolutely magical about watching something, looking at something that you traditionally just, it's been a one-way thing, and then pressing a button, and across the vastness of space and time in the internet, you reach around the world, and then go in real time, affect something in that game, and change it, your name shows up. That's magic. That's magic. That's about as close to magic as you can possibly get. And that was what Killing Floor 2 did. Now, there's another game called Death's Door, and Death's Door is a very simple game, uh, it's a text-based adventure from kind of like back in the 80s. So think Dungeons and Dragons. You're in an eerie cave. There is a dragon screaming to your right. There is si eerie silence to your left. Do you want to go left or right? The answer is not eerie silence, right? Never. There's always something hanging out there. <laughs> yeah, it's going to get you. But um, So this was a game that I think had it just launched on Steam as a text adventure, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know that it would have done that great. Um, but on Mixer... What they did was they actually, this game was played by the audience. So the audience voted where they wanted to go. The audience voted how to attack the, the, the creatures. The audience gained levels. And then when they came back, they watched another screen. They were still that level, and they gained weapons and stuff. And so super interesting, like super, super interesting, where like when you take a, a regular game genre, you add interactivity, it suddenly becomes a much more compelling game. Uh, last one is uh, an example of Sorry About Your Cats. Now, this is not a game. This is a robot show. So what this guy does is he has these little robots, and he has them go through mazes, um, but uh, the audience actually controls the robots. So they're in his house, and the audience in real time controls the robots as they go through his maze. Um, and then he's got a little camera on them, so you can see a first-person view, you can see the top-down view. So interactivity is broader than just games. We have a bunch of people on television coming, talking to us about it. Um, and it's not just a mixer thing. It's not just a mixer thing. So industry is small. Best friends of mine over at Twitch, doing the same job that I'm doing over at Twitch. Very good friends of mine. 
uh, I was down having lunch with uh, my equivalents over at Facebook last week, talking to them about video. Um, same thing at YouTube, okay? This is, this is an industry-wide phenomenon, okay? Uh, you saw in the, in the news, uh, uh, YouTube announced that they were working on ultra-low latency. Uh, Twitch at PAX announced on stage that interactive is the future of live streaming. That's what they said, end quote. Um, and then you can imagine from uh, other people that haven't announced things yet, you'll probably hear a little bit more about interactive being the future of live streaming. So I want, I, want you to, I want you to imagine in the limit of what it could be. Now imagine that someone's streaming in VR and it's a horror game. And then the audience can do like jump scare right behind them. Imagine that they'll like fall down, probably knock over their television and like this, I, like entertainment value. Like that is absolute entertainment gold. Or you can imagine playing a, a real-time strategy game with thousands and thousands of people across the battlefield on these two sides. But what if each one of those thousands of people is controlled by a person in the audience? It was a huge epic battle. Or uh, what about a real-time Dungeons & Dragons game where you're going through dungeon after dungeon, fighting monsters, opening chests, but the whole thing is driven by the audience, where the audience is actually creating the next room, where the audience is actually choosing what monsters to spawn, where the audience is actually choosing what treasure drops and what loot drops. Imagine that, okay? So that's, so that, that's the beginning of like what live streaming could be. So when I think about and I talk about um, uh, some of the design things that we've learned is you have to think about as you build your games, what, uh, how do you help the streamer be successful? The streamer needs to generate lots and lots of content. And so if you can do something where you help that streamer generate content, then streamers are going to gravitate towards your game. If you can do something where you fill that dead space. And then, and this one I've always struggled with as a, as a game developer myself, when someone said, you got to go make your game uh, good to be watched, I forgot what the phrase was in the YouTube days. And I always struggled with that one because I didn't really know what that meant. I was like, well, I don't know. I'm creating a single player story driven tragedy. How do I make that fun to watch? Um, but live streaming changes it because when your audience can now play the game with the player, you can just think of them as players. So your viewers are now players. And all the design lessons that you're real good at, all the things that you know, you can apply to those viewers. Okay. And then the last thing is um, you want to think about how you reward for broadcasting and watching. Th those are big. So do I have an incentive in my game to broadcast? Do I become more famous in the game? Do I get more currency in the game? Like what, what is the reason why I should go broadcast? Does it make the game a little bit easier when I have a bunch of other people, people watching with me? Like, you know, do we mine ore faster or whatever it is? Um, and then there's an incentive to, to watch. Like if I watch, do I then get rewards? So I can be watching and getting rewards inside the game, and I don't have to be playing. So when you think about those incentives, when you think about trying to create a game loop or progression loop around not just playing but watching, um, that'll help uh, your game be more and more successful. And so I did, I, I did want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, numbers, because I remember I mentioned that Steam has 6, 000, around 6,000 games probably this year, maybe more, uh, that are going to launch. So I find, and uh, part of this is I have, I have inside info that you guys don't have, so it makes sense that I, I would come to these different conclusions. But um, uh, oftentimes we sort of look at those markets that have the most numbers. So like, well, we'll go look at, I mean, everybody, every, raise your hand if you're playing on shipping on Steam. Oh, actually, not that many people. Raise your hand if you're playing on shipping a platform other than Steam. Good for you guys. So here's the thing. If you, if you go to the place where everyone is publishing, even though, even though Steam has a huge install base, like absolutely massive, but it also has a lot of games. Okay. So now I, I, I ran into a few people over here who are saying they're going to go to Switch. Good for you. You've probably been reading the articles that independent developers are doing really well on Switch right now. It's true because there's like 16 games. So it turns out that when you, when you divide, when you divide six, I think they have 48 now, but like, but when you divide that number of games by the install base, your exposure is so much higher. And same thing with, if you haven't heard of the Xbox Creators Program, you should go race as fast as you can to go get on that store, um, because that only has last time I checked it was 48 games. Um, and uh, and and so if you find those opportunities, you actually want to look at those two things. You want to look at um, how big is the install base, okay? And so long as that install base is bigger in total 
than your target, then you're fine. Then you're fine. Don't worry about how big it is. Just as long as it's bigger than your max expected, then you're fine. Now, second thing is what's your competition look like? How many other how many other things are in that in that category, in that category of the store, et cetera, et cetera. So and then you think about those two things. So anyway, I, I just want you to think about those um, rather than just looking at raw numbers. And for me, um, I've been lucky, so I, I got to win an IGF award. Um, I have done games that have done um, 100,000 unit type of sales. Um, and, and then I've got this cool job, and I've done a bunch of other, I've worked on Xbox One X, a bunch of other cool stuff. But it's, it's not, and I'm pretty convinced about this, it's, it's not because I'm smart. Like, I actually, I've taken IQ tests. I know I'm not smart. I know I'm pretty average based on what the tests tell me. And then you might say, well, maybe it's because it's hard work. Maybe that's why. I'm pretty hard working. Wes knows this. I work pretty hard. Um, but I would say, no, it's not, it's, not, it's not hard work. I think I'm in the position I am because of luck, timing and luck. Being in the right place at the right time. Um, you know, any one of you could be here. If you were in the if you're in the same places at the same times as I was, so like I don't think it's hard work. I think there's a lot of people, you know, in uh, in North Africa working super super hard who don't get to do it. Like it. So I, I don't I don't think that's it. And I think it's just luck. I think I'm up here talking to you guys, giving a keynote because of luck. I think that's why. And so what it means is that it's my responsibility to give back because. I'm here and I'm in this special position. And so it's my job to go help all of you achieve success. Just like when, you know, some amount of you will also be very, very successful. And don't be confused. It's not because we're working hard, it's not because we're smart, it's because you got lucky. And so it's your job to go give back. Right? Now, when I think about like making our marks in the industry, like how many of us would just give a million dollars to go back in time to right before Mario 64, you know? With, with the knowledge that we have now, um, and then invent genres, you know? Like, think about all the stuff you would do if you had that time machine. Go back in time, and you could go create the next Mario, the next Zelda. Imagine about that, if you could go do that. Well, so here's the truth. The truth, and the truth is painful, is that it, it's a timing thing. There are people who shaped our industry, and they did so because were they smart? Sure, they probably, probably smart. Were they hardworking? Yeah, they were probably hardworking. But they were also very lucky. They were very, very lucky to be in the industry at the time when they were in the industry. And so for you guys, can you make the next Mario? You know, I'll be realistic. Like, you know, that time has passed. But there is two places, I believe, two places where you can do the equivalent. One is VR. You know, I don't think we've yet had our killer application in VR. I don't think we've seen it yet. And, a, and AR as well. So I think that's one, that's one place. But then I think actually a bigger place is this live stream stuff I'm talking about, interactive live streaming. And I think, and I think specifically, and I'm kind of convicted about this, that it's going to be an independent developer who is going to innovate in both those spaces. Specifically live streaming, though. V VR, it's been a few years. Um, the larger publishers are starting to go uh, make some games in that space. Live streaming, you heard it here first. Literally, like, we just, we just got into this business like a month ago. You know, like, we just had our first two games come a month ago. Like, this is brand new. Everyone here is in a special space because you're hearing this for the first time. Live streaming is going to be huge. Like it's going to be absolutely huge interactive live streaming. And if somebody can go make that interactive experience, it's going to be genre defining. Like it's going to, it's going to be and have the same equivalence as Mario 64 did for 3D cameras um, or 3D platformers. Yeah, I promise you. Like I promise you. Like this is the biggest fundamental shift in our industry uh, that I've seen in a decade. So this is the opportunity. And guess what? It's going to be pretty hard. <laughs> it's going to be pretty hard from a creative perspective. From a creative perspective. From a technical perspective, I encourage you to check out um, the Mixer SDK. So we've got an SDK for Unity, Unreal, and C++. And so uh, just go on the Asset Store and search for Mixer. You'll find it. 
go play around with it. We've worked very, very hard to make it very, very easy, but the design side, the design side, okay, the creative side, that's where it is a blue ocean, okay? It's a blue ocean out there. And when I think about myself looking at trying to tell the story of interactive, I need games. I need games that are pushing the limits of what it means to do interactive content. And when I find one of those games, okay, and I'm looking at Wes, he's looking back at me. When we find one of those games, okay, we will amplify that game, the nth degree, okay? We absolutely will. So, so uh, in, in order to go tell that story. And so what, uh, what, I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna leave you with is um, uh, two things. Um, one, it, it, as, as somebody who has a lot more data than anybody else in this room in terms of what's coming, uh, there is a window of time on this one. There absolutely is a window of time before it becomes crowded, before people figure it out. You know, there is a window of time. So um, now is the time to start thinking about it. Like if, if you're like, I really want to go make my mark in the industry, now is that time to go do it. And then the second thing is, uh, if you do have um, a really cool idea for interactive, uh, Mixer Dev Info at Microsoft.com. Okay, Mixer M I X E R Dev D E V Info I N F O at Microsoft.com. Email us and let us know. And I'm probably not supposed to give that out, but I just did. So <laughs> exactly, um, cool. So that uh, so so that that uh, thank you so much for. Uh, Listen. All right. I, I think I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a little bit of Q and A. What are we doing on time? I have thirty minutes. All right. Why don't we do this? Why don't we do like a, a little bit of Q and A, and then I imagine a bunch of you guys want to come and talk to me about how you can get a job. Okay. So. All right, yeah, let's pass, uh, let's pass, uh, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you choose people. Yes, check, hey. Um, so you guys know this is live stream, so please wait for the microphone. We do have some questions from the Mixer audience. Um, Lothorian would like to know what your uh, opinion is and how you value other distribution systems other than stream like itch.io. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, great question. So the question is how I value um, other distribution mechanisms. So, so I absolutely love uh, what's going on with um, alternate distribution mechanisms. Um, and if, you know, if anyone says different, then I, I sort of question why they're in the business. But uh, I think that competition is the best thing for our industry. And so I think when developers have more than one place where they can go sell uh, their content, then I think it's great for all of us. It pushes uh, people like me who do work on stores um, to go make better stores. Um, and then it also uh, gives a little bit of negotiating power, I think, to, to developers like yourself. You know, if there's just one store, then you lose all of that. And so I'm a big fan. Oh, great talk. Um, so essentially you were talking about the interactive streaming earlier. So is that technically like a form of cloud computing? If the streamer is running the hardware and the audience is interacting, I mean, those could technically be sprites and you're just jumping around and doing stuff. Basically, yeah. right? Yeah, great, great question. So that, yeah, the question is around, uh, I think, how does it work? Um, and so the 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 story on that one is, um, you know, I've been I've been in this business for a while. Like I did Smart Glass, which never kind of took off in the way I wanted it to, and then AirPlay never really took off in the way I wanted it to. Um, but so but I've been trying to do this like two-way television for a long time, and I know that a key part of that was um, that we have to build all the all the services to make that happen, and. Uh, when you think about Mixer Interactive and a bunch of other platforms as well, you're going to see the, plat the people who have the streaming platform build the low latency uh, transport so that you can write code just in your game client and then enable all of those experiences so you don't have to worry about uh, a server. And uh, that game code is super simple. It's literally like we're talking about two lines of game code. So it'll be something like uh, get button, say the name of the button, a button just shows up for the viewer and then input comes back to the game. So we try to make it super easy and we're constantly working on making it even easier. Thank you. Yep. So talking about like various types of streaming, how do you feel about um, developers streaming the development of their game and how does that relate to mm -hmm. like, this next generation of live yeah. streaming? Yeah, so I, so I love it. It's funny, we were, um, uh, it was after a, uh, 
I was talking to a pretty big developer actually about, about that subject. So very good question. Um, the way I think about it is I, I think it's something that um, we're going to see more and more of. I think the problem that we have right now is um, uh, developers aren't the most entertaining. I, like I don't have a good. I should find it. Found a, a spin. A spin. A serious amount of spin on that one. Uh, we're all like I, I'm a. I'm a. I'm an introvert. Look, I'm an introvert. So like you know it. We're you know we speak through our art. Like most of us speak through our. We're in this business because we speak through our art, not you know through ourselves. And so I think the challenge will be around. Um, and I think this is where Mixer helps. Um, a lot of what I spend my time thinking on is how do I give you like a, a segment of a show to come on and then give you a very talented MC or interviewer. Um, and in fact, to be honest, you know, it's similar to what, you know, uh, the, um, uh, the folks who put on this conference are doing for developers, which is like, how do I give you a safe podium um, to go express yourself and engage with an audience rather than you have to learn how to set up a channel, you have to advertise that channel. Um, you have to figure out overnight how to be entertaining and like, so, uh, so, but, but, I, but I do think it's important. I think it's critically important um, to engage your audience in, in that way to do play tests, to figure out if they like your games, to kind of build up a followership before you actually go to beta or you go to alpha. Another question from the internet. God Machine asks if Mixer is considering SDKs for other engines like GMK. Oh, uh, okay. That's a, that's a really, really good question. And also a tough question for me to answer. Uh, I assume they're talking about uh, Game Maker. So uh, G Game Maker, like, I, I love Game Maker. They're such a great engine, and uh, I've worked with them for many, many years now. Um, and basically, the only way I can answer this question is I, I have nothing to comment on that at time. Like, I just don't have it. I'm not allowed to kind of go into more detail than that. How in-depth of an interaction can we get? Like, I, I know you're saying that the, the watcher gets to, like, push a button, but um, can they, like, control a turret or something? something like that that's you know shooting at the player or something like that yeah, is there something that you're able to do yeah great question so it's about what level of interaction we can do and um uh absolutely i think actually that thing that you just described totally doable like totally doable it's something where um uh at work we'll actually go play games through mixer a lot of the time because the latency is low enough you can just play play the game right through the stream job shack 80 asks when should a game consider charity streaming to help sell their game Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so, uh, so, so I actually, I, I, I haven't, I, I honestly haven't thought about that one. Uh, like charity streaming um, to sell a game. Um, I don't, I, I don't know. I'll have to answer. I actually don't know on that one. Mm -hmm. um, so you were mentioning that basically this is the best and a free form of marketing for games. But how do you market that marketing? So, mm -hmm. for instance. If you're not so I I don't I use Reddit and yep. sometimes Facebook. I don't use Twitter, but Twitter I've heard is a really good way of mm -hmm. kind of getting the yep. game dev community. If for somebody who doesn't really use the social media, is there any other way to advertise that you that people can interact through Mixer or through yep. any other thing? Yeah, so the so uh the the best way it's I'll I'll speak to Mixer, but this goes for um uh all other live streaming services. So um, man, we are laser focused on interactive live streaming. I'll tell you, like we are laser focused on it. And so um, the, the best thing you can do is create something cool that takes advantage of interactive. And then I think, you know, we in some way will be coming to you rather than the other way around. So, so if, and like I said, it's a, it's a time limited thing. So there's a, there's a window of time before thousands of people are doing this. But, but in that moment, uh, in, in these moments that we have, um, uh, if, if you make something cool, the advice that I gave 10 years ago, like if you, if you make something cool, marketing could take care of itself. Um, PB Abstraction uh, says, Mixer seems to be focusing primarily on publishing streams of PUBG and Fortnite. How do you think developers of other games could best utilize the plat platform to help get noticed more? All right. Yeah, great question. So um, this one, I'm going to look at Wes. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so <laughs> Wes should answer that. Uh, Wes is actually on our... Uh, um, so for those, how many people don't don't know Wes? Oh, a lot of people. Okay. Hey, Wes, you want it? You got we got a microphone for you to introduce yourself. Uh, All right. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, I'm a partner manager with Mixer, and uh, I'm a, I'm a partner manager with Mixer, and uh, while yes, Fortnite and PUBG are some of the most popular uh, games that we have on the platform right now, that's not us doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the streamers making those choices. Um, we ha actually love to say, hey, why don't you check mm -hmm. out this game? I I'm promoting uh, the Battlefront mm -hmm. 2 
beta this weekend. Working with Xbox, we tied together to do a promo where they made all of the silver Xbox users able to do free multiplayer for the weekend. And we tied it in with the uh, Battlefront 2 uh, uh, beta. And so we were active in trying to get our streamers to participate in that. We don't want people to be playing just Fortnite and PUBG. We want people doing lots of things. When Killing Floor 2 launched, we got we talked with Tripwire and got mm -hmm. keys into the hands of our streamers because we wanted people to see the power of the platform. Because the thing that is interesting with interactive to me is this is not this is people digging into the guts of the game that the person is playing. It's not like you know, it's it's not like an overlay. This isn't something that, you know, that just adds a little bit. I mean, this is affecting the game that the people are playing. And it was incredible. A lot of people dug in deep, and we promoted it because we recognized that our platform had a unique interest in promoting that content. So making interactive content is going to get us to push your product for you. I'm a partner manager. As soon as I find out about a game that has interactive, I will hand it to every one of my partners. And I'll say, here is something cool. Go and do something cool with this cool thing, and you'll be cool. So, I like that. That was a very good answer. Uh, Lothorian asks, is Microsoft planning on any tools with Mixer to match up artists with streamers or developers? Oh, that's a, that's a really, really great question. Uh, so uh, so far, um, uh, we, we didn't have anything planned, but now that you mentioned it, uh, I'm going to go back uh, to my team, which is the interactive team, and I'm going to go write it down. I'm going to let the team know about it. So thank you for bringing it up. So I have a two-part question. Um, the first part of my question, you mentioned the evolution of game engines and how you started on Game Maker, then Unity, and Unreal came out. Amazon Lumberyard mm -hmm. just recently launched yep. a few years ago, I guess. Yep. And Amazon bought Twitch. So what are the implications for developers as far as whether or not they should be using Lumberyard? and how that's going to affect interactive built-in stuff for the engine. And then the second part is, do you think that Unity and Unreal will also have those tools, like a uh, built-in SDK? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. So I think um, uh, it's, it's a great question that, um, because of my contractual obligations to all those companies, uh, I'm going to have to tiptoe around the answer to that. Uh, so, um, so, so, so first, you know, I think it's, it's, it's hard to say, and I think it's too early to know whether uh, interactivity is actually going to be built into the... Well, I'll talk about the problem. So if you, if you build interaction into an engine, um, then you get to move at the pace of the engine in terms of, of, in terms of fixing bugs, et cetera. Because like, you can imagine if, 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 if I did build interaction into Unity, um, then I need to wait for the 20, you know, 2017.2 or 3 or 4. Uh, uh, to go fix things um, or add new features, and I think we're we're at this stage right now where it's so new, like it's just so new that um, I think the the right strategy, which is the one that we're taking, is to shift out of band of any of the engines. And so, well, we still have a Unity plugin because Unity and, and Unreal has a plugin system as well. So, like, well, we still have we plug in the major engines. Um, I I think that shipping outside of the engine. Uh, for now, makes the most sense for us. All right, so I just did a quick look through the Mixer API. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty awesome. interested in this. Um, and I was seeing that it was going through uh, Sparks transactions mm -hmm. for those interactions. And I was wondering if you all had considered using that as a method of rewarding or paying out to the developers of the games to encourage them to make more content mm -hmm. that is engaging for the stream process itself. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a really really good question um, about uh, do we kind of pay the sparks back uh, or or do any other thing to kind of pay back you know for the developers for doing um, some cool interaction wise. So I mean I, the the first one is um, uh, because their content's more engaging and because like Wes mentioned um, it'll get promoted uh, more. Uh, we think that that's a, a pretty good incentive you know kind of just by itself. Um, uh, over like just straight us cutting checks. Um, so, uh, but that said, you know, we're, we're always looking at and kind of evaluating and, and, and it's early days. So uh, it's something that I'm going to take back to the team and we'll go chat with the team about it. I got a question for the audience. Who already has a Mixer channel? Yeah, 
Yeah, I was going to, actually, it's very similar to the question I just asked before, because you've talked about it mainly as a source of, like, advertising. Um, but I was wondering, like, it seems like there's a lot of new revenue streams that could mm -hmm. open up from this as well, too. And so, like, what's what's kind of going on in that area? Yeah, so it's, a, it's a great question. So so there was, a, there was a developer who asked me the other day, it was maybe last week, where they said, like, man, if you, if you just did X, whatever the feature was, um, I wouldn't even have to ship a game on the store. I could actually just ship a mixer game and I could sustain my studio. And it was an interesting thought. Um, and I think there's actually a lot of validity to that where you can imagine like, well, if I did, if I, if I didn't have to ship in a store, like Death Door is actually an example of this. Like Death Door is a game that um, doesn't actually ship in any, you can't, you can only play that game on mixer. You actually cannot play that game outside of mixer. And, um, and it's something that we as a team want to go support and want to find a way to support it. Um, but we're just trying to, we're still trying to think about, you know, how, like how you can do that. So it, it's so early, like the game came out maybe a month ago. So, uh, don't have a good answer yet, but, um, but absolutely something that philosophically like we're looking into. 3D Crusader asks, what do you think the toughest barriers are to streaming VR content? And can you see VR making a legit push into the streaming industry? All right, cool. So, uh, so this is 3D Crusader. By the way, if you haven't, um, uh, you should go follow the channel. He does some really cool uh, stuff around uh, VR streaming, um, and he's also actually a Unity developer who actually uses our SDK. So, um, uh, so it it's so it's challenging. Like it's challenging. You can imagine like so. So this is like how do you stream uh, VR content because like you're wearing a thing like this. So do you point a camera at yourself? That's what actually he did. Like. You could point a camera at yourself, and then you're doing this, and you have another camera that does actual what you're seeing. Um, it's it's something that I can tell you internally, like we're we're thinking about, but um, it's still super early days on that one. Yep. That just brought me one question. <laughs> now, you mentioned about how how the API supports the use of inter interactive content creations and such. It now, it, may, it begs the question, what if, say, one can use this technology to actually, for game developers, the game team to actually create, to, to create the game more easily? I mean, one can just, one can simply just make the, yeah, one can simply just make the um, artwork, the assets, the environment mm -hmm. art, and, and all the other content, and then they can have their team on a live stream, uh, Interact yeah. with the content to create the levels for the games to ship and such. Interactive yeah. game development. Yeah, absolutely. Made easier. So I, so I, as as a game developer, I'm super excited about it. And by the way, Studio Crusader, who actually just asked the last question, do, uh, does this where he'll do a stream and then he'll ask his audience, like, "Do you want a cannon?" All right, he goes finds a cannon and, and then puts it in, and he's like, "I don't know, I feel like I should have a shield." And then he'll go make himself a shield because people start. And then when he drops the cannon, he always puts it up to interactive. So. People start shooting him. He's like, I think I need a shield. So he makes a shield, and like, so, it, and it's it's super entertaining if you haven't watched that. Like, interact interactive game development is like this inception of inception type of thing where you just, it's 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 pretty cool to watch. Um, so uh, what we might do is, uh, why don't we do uh, one more question because I want to give the folks a chance to just come up to me and ask me like career stuff. So, all right, you got the last question, and you can always ask me later in the one on one. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm sorry, maybe you might have gotten this before because I left the room for a little bit, but uh, so I apologize if you did. But um, I've heard a lot of uh, streamers who stream mostly competitive multiplayer games. Mm -hmm. They complain about the problem of stream sniping yep. because they want to play live, they want to interact with their audience live, but at the same time, they have people who come onto the channel just you know if they're yeah. in Hearthstone, look at their hand. If they're in uh, PUBG, look at their position, yeah. and you know just sort of ruin the experience for them, and sometimes even for the audience. Mm -hmm. So do you know any way that you could possibly combat this or mitigate this issue? Yeah, so that's a great question. So it, it's one of the things that's actually top of mind for us right now. Like I think the one genre, if you want to think about NP complete or you know unsolved problems that uh, smart people like yourselves can go think about and really innovate on, is is how you do it in a competitive environment because of stream sniping. So um, for a bunch of genres, it's it's easy to think about like how you add interaction. But um, specifically around competition, uh, we're thinking about interactions that don't affect core gameplay. So maybe something like you're cheering for somebody, or maybe something where it affects in a slight a slight slight way, but that statistically it can't affect the outcome, um, or uh, cosmetic visual things, um, or things that aren't bound to time. So like maybe I can. Um, predict that, I, or maybe I can, maybe you and I can wager on the outcome of this match, and then at the end we see who won. And so that one, 
I don't have to be real time uh, for it for it to um, for it to happen. But but that one honestly is just so much space I think to innovate. So uh, you know we're still figuring out. All right, are we at time? Uh, it's your call. You okay. Can go in, uh, yeah. So so yeah. So what I might do because I want to give you guys a chance because I want to I want to make sure everyone can get to the next event. But I know a bunch of you want to talk to me about just career stuff. So um, uh, what, I'll, what I'll probably do is I'll probably uh, thank everyone for their time, and then I'm going to stick around uh, so all the students can come talk to me, or, or anyone else actually who wants to ask me questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.